good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whenever you're watching this. Uh, you know, I'm very happy to come to you at the start of this NANOG. Uh, I really wish we were in person, just like I think many other people uh, would be. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, why I had to start a telephone company or how I actually got high speed internet access to my house. So, quick background uh, I moved to my current house in 2002. Uh, you know, it's right on the outskirts of uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and at the time, you know, uh, it, it was great. The people who I worked for, they provided me a T1 uh, to uh, the local pop. And, you know, and back in 2002, you know, a megabit symmetric, a megabit and a half symmetric, uh, you know, was, was really, you know, still relatively decent considering, uh, you know, a lot of the technology options that were out there at the time. Uh, you know, and, you know, for, for everything that, you know, we're kind of expecting, you expect uh, development around, you know, cities and Ann Arbor is one of the cities where it's been slowly growing outward for a number of years. Uh, and people are putting in new subdivisions and stuff. And I kind of expected that, you know, with uh, stuff like cable moving from one way to two way cable systems, DSL, uh, people starting to talk, talk about fiber to the home, uh, you know, that those types of services would reach uh, the location, you know, where I lived. But the reality is, nothing actually came out here. Uh, and, you know, today I'm still about, you know, a little bit over two miles away from, you know, the existing service areas where you can actually get high speed internet. So where do I live? On the west side of Ann Arbor. No, you keep going further west. You keep going further west. And then, you know, I guess the way you'd really describe it is farm adjacent. So I, I live where that, you know, little yellow pin is. You can all now, uh, you know, find my house on Google Earth if you want it. Uh, and th this is a screenshot of kind of what it looked like back in the day. And you can see an upper, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll, uh, you know, and through the area over the years, you'll actually see the development pop in, uh, you know, out in these areas where, you know, it could be reasonably expected these farms are being developed and that eventually services are, are going to go and uh, show up and come into the town, uh, you know, come and uh, connect into where I live. Uh, you know, and then you start to get to, you know, recent days, we've got new subdivisions and new developments going in, grocery stores, hardware stores and stuff. So I've got this problem, creates conflict. I really have no high speed internet. Am I, am I going to move? You know, I'm, uh, you know, the seller obviously pays commission, uh, you know, so there's actually a significant cost for me to move. I did a financial analysis of this actually to figure out, okay, how much would it actually cost me to move? you know, in uh, fixing up the home, getting it ready to, for being sold, uh, et cetera. But also how much money am I going to lose uh, in moving? We actually kind of like the house that we live in and the location and stuff. And what you actually find is a lot of these homes out in uh, rural communities, they're actually devalued because there's no high speed uh, internet access available. If you go talk to realtors or if you've gone home shopping yourselves and you say, oh, no high speed internet, you know, just in the same way that we in this community would treat it, a lot of actually uh, smart consumers are doing that. So at least for a while, I had a wireless ISP uh, that came to my temporary rescue. And I had, uh, I got about 50 megabit service from him for, uh, you know, for 10 years. So what's a geek like me supposed to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to start a telephone company. So you get around, get up, you file a tariff, and hopefully one day I'm going to profit from this. So let me give you some more details because there's a lot of details and planning that goes into this. You've got to identify who your customers are, internet access, how you're going to do construction, you know, find the contractors, you know, you go on fiber locator or one of the other types of services out there and find things, you know, you spend a lot of time doing research, planning, trying to piece together all of the finances. And then, you know, I actually even went out and I started pre-building fiber uh, as early as 2018. And I started to connect the, uh, the, uh, the wireless ISP customers uh, who were actually hanging off of my home. My home actually hosted the, uh, the antenna, the micro pop or whatever you want to call it uh, for my street. And I actually went and I started to connect those people uh, to my home directly with fiber in order to provide access and to provide a way for uh, you know, them to have good, reliable service as wireless interference, as more people uh, started turning on devices and made that a lot harder. You know, so what do you do? You look up your access, your costs. Today, uh, you know, this is a snapshot of the website. Uh, this is, uh, I verified this a couple days ago. It's still, uh, I can get one and a half megabits. The, uh, 
you know, for roughly about 39, 40, you know, $40 a month. Uh, you know, I talked to, uh, you know, different providers about getting access to me. Comcast was actually remarkably the easiest to work with. Uh, they could actually get me a quote and say, this is what it would actually go uh, and cost to extend the network, uh, uh, their network to my home. And, uh, you know, could give me a price and a number that I could actually go around, talk to my other neighbors and say, hey, I'm willing to pay some amount of this. Are any of you interested in paying some money for this? Uh, and, and turned out that was no. You know, I wasn't going to pay, you know, a, a, a bill for $50,000 uh, personally as a, you know, as a single home. Uh, it, it, you know, that starts to hit that range where it actually makes a bit of sense to say, okay, no, really, maybe moving is actually the right choice. So I started doing a lot more research. I played around with active Ethernet solutions. I got uh, distributors to sell me hardware from Zone and play with that. I go and I, you know, start playing around with GPON. I have a nice lab down in my, uh, in my basement of all places. Uh, I'm actually using the, uh, the Unify solution. Uh, you know, they've got the UFOLT. Um, you know, it's pretty nice. And then the next thing you do, which is really important, is you start marketing. You have to go and engage in active marketing and tell people, hey, I'm building this. Uh, you know, so talk to many people. Uh, I actually went and I mailed letters to a lot of these potential subscribers. And the research, it really never ends. I talked to a lot of other, you know, service providers who are doing fiber to the home. I talked to people, you know, all around the world. Uh, talked to community groups, the little, uh, you know, ISP cooperatives, uh, you know, uh, in my area who are trying to do something. Uh, we have a local uh, township here that actually passed a, uh, a, a millage to basically provide universal service to, they have got about a thousand homes or something in the township. Uh, and and they, they're one of the only ones in the state of Michigan who was able to do this and actually fund it with, uh, with tax dollars to go and uh, offset, offset the build costs associated with that. Um, and, and I talked to all the people who are involved in that and try to figure out, okay, what works, you know, what's viable, and really also understand the competitive landscape that I was looking at. So what do you do? You start spending some money. Uh, I bought a fusion splicer actually back in 2016. Uh, I actually bought some of that initial fiber that I've been using back in 2017. You know, I got my OT, first OTDR back in 2018, you know, Jared's, Jared's first OTDR, which definitely makes things, uh, you know, uh, makes it a lot easier to troubleshoot when something goes wrong with that fiber uh, and stuff. And then I started spending a whole bunch of money. I spent it on design and permitting, got master plans, got the tariffs filed. Uh, I actually had to join, you know, the 811 in Michigan, we call it the Mystig system. Uh, you know, I know a lot of other places call it one call or something else. Uh, and then, you know, last year in April, I actually filed for my permit uh, and went round and round with the uh, permitting agency uh, and stuff on all of the little details that needed to be done. And I ultimately got my permit in September of last year. Well, that went and pushed my build schedule firmly into 2020 because when you get into the fall, the construction costs, at least up here uh, where we get snow and and, and stuff. Uh, a lot of the construction costs are based on access to things like water uh, uh, and materials like that, which you actually need to, uh, to run the equipment. Uh, and as it gets colder, obviously that becomes a lot harder, uh, you know, and we've already had a couple good, not, not real hard freezes this year already, but we've had uh, definitely frost out in the morning. Uh, and that, that's made the local water guys not want to, you know, in the spring that made them not want me to give me a meter so I could get water out of the hydrants. Uh, at that time. So what did I do? I try to spend, spread out of the costs. So, you know, I went and I used thing, you know, used money that I got, uh, you know, over time, be it bonuses or other things uh, to go and spread out those costs to actually uh, make that work. Uh, I found, you know, local distributors, uh, national distributors to sell me the, underground, the right underground supplies um, and, and spent a little bit here, a little bit there. And it really goes a long way when you're starting to get all the planning. Uh, and, and stuff done. And I went, I did some stuff and I said, okay, yeah, this is probably going to be about a $60,000 project for me to do, which is why, you know, the 50,000 for Comcast, you know, and other things uh, and, and cost to move really made me say, no, this is, this is probably the right thing to do. So ha had to line up all sorts of stuff. You know, you line up bonus money, you don't know what you're going to need. So, you know, you do things like home equity line of credit, uh, because that has certain tax advantages, uh, depending on how much you earn. 
uh, you know, I lined up customer money. One of the, one of the things that was great is, uh, there's these guys, uh, in Michigan in for Jen's township called, uh, for Jen's broadband or VB fiber. Uh, the guy there was really helpful for me. He went and shared the business model that worked well for him where customers would actually help offset those upfront build costs. Uh, and so if you are willing to pay $5,000 upfront, you get $50 off uh, credit for hundred months off your bill. Uh, and that's something that he found actually uh, worked and resonated with people. Uh, I made sure, you know, when we drew up paperwork for this, that it stayed with the property. So if you sell the home, you know, that credit stays there. I don't just get to keep it as, uh, you know, even though I'm a telephone company, I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily an evil one. Uh, but it also keeps the customer paying something. So you do have some recurring revenue over that customer life cycle. Uh, and it really helps offset those startup costs, which, you know, I found out were quite significant. So what did I do? I sat down, I actually drew up uh, you know, a spreadsheet with month by month run rate of everything that it would cost me over, uh, uh, over the time of the project and figured out, okay, how, how much money am I actually gonna put out? Because I have to put out all this money. Uh, I was able to get labor down to seven and a quarter a foot, uh, which is actually really good. I got two conduits buried underground for that, uh, for that labor cost. That drove up my conduit costs, getting two conduits, but uh, that was really worthwhile. Uh, it, it, you know, it's some, something where, you know, it was only an extra quarter of foot to do that. But in doing this spreadsheet, I was able to then go and spell out, okay, how much money do I need to pay? When? So I can understand, you know, how, how to budget everything out. Uh, and then I actually put in all the customer models. Okay how much money am I gonna lose? How much am I gonna spend? What's that gonna look like month by month? Uh, and by going out and doing a lot of these pre-installations, I had built in customers uh, into the revenue model uh, on day one. And so that allowed me to actually reach a uh, cash flow positive position very, very quickly, uh, which is really essential for a business such that you're not continuing to spend money uh, that you don't have uh, and continue to run yourself in debt, which is uh, definitely a trap a lot of businesses end up in. So this financial modeling, modeling, really, really important. You know, it, it put together what my run rate was, uh, put my forecast for full year expenses, all of the things that come up, uh, you know, kind of irregularly like insurance and the 811 system costs, costs, but also the forecast for unexpected expenses, you know, repairs, disputes, any sort of refunds or bad debt that I may have to absorb as well, uh, you know, can, can be factored into, into that model. Um, so, uh, you know, I mentioned a little bit about, you know, these pre-builds, uh, you know, I worked with the existing wireless ISP. I said, Hey, I'm going to hook, hook these people up with fiber. I'm going to do it at my expense. Uh, I'm going to be pre-wired, pre-constructed. And I said, you continue to retain these people, the customer revenue until such time as, uh, I was actually live with my service. Uh, but, you know, I also got to build out rack space and fiber distribution and patch panels and stuff uh, in, in my house in order to, to terminate stuff. I actually got a whole home generator as part of this project to make sure that I have uh, stand up backup power and stand and everything is automatic for uh, when the service, uh, you know, when the electrical service is interrupted. So what's an install look like? Uh, here I've got a couple photos of what that looks like on the side of a home. Uh, I've got, you know, a little media converter. You've got the fiber drop coming up to the home. And then you also have, you know, the, uh, a photo I took of the, uh, the patch panel as I was assembling it uh, with the, uh, uh, this has a couple uh, just two strand cables or uh, two strand cables coming in up there at the top. And that is actually a 24 strand cable coming in there on the bottom. Uh, so I have uh, a number of strands from the inside of my house out in duct all the way to uh, out through the hand holes uh, on my property. So typical customer installation, I actually use these uh, Microtech media converters. Uh, they're really inexpensive and work well. I use the UF Instant with the OLT. Uh, I use this uh, enclosure on the outside of the home from uh, uh, Total Cable Solutions. Go get some armor, some of the armored patch cords. Uh, John Van Oppen actually suggested these a number of years ago to me. Uh, they're they're nice and durable, uh, you know, and you can uh, you know you can kind of abuse them, and they can go between uh, the the fiber nid and uh, the media converter. Uh, and then you run just regular Cat five PoE from the inside to the outside. And if a customer wants a wireless router, I provide one for 
for them at, you know, at cost. So I don't have to worry about any of the tax implications of that, of like collecting sales tax and stuff like that. Uh, so I don't need a sales tax license, which is uh, important, but I, I basically sell this at a pass through cost uh, to them. So you continue to go out and get supplies. So, you know, this is me loading up, uh, you know, a Prius with uh, supplies. You can see, I didn't even take my rock climbing gear out of there. Uh, and stuff, and you start digging holes, and you start putting this stuff in ground, you know, in the ground. Uh, I'll tell you, it's really funny when you roll up in a Prius uh, at some of these places, and you say, "Hey, yeah, I, I really want that, uh, you know, that concrete handhold tossed in the back here." Um, it, it definitely amuses them, especially. Uh, I, I had a case where I needed to pick up a new tread for uh, uh, one of the pieces, uh, new tracks or tread for one of the pieces of equipment, and just throw, yeah, throw it in the back of the Prius. It's, you know, it's fine. So yeah, so, um, but you, you still need to spend all this time, you know, doing work, collecting the customers. Uh, our local county, they've got a tool called Map Washtenaw. I live in Washtenaw County. Um, and you can look at all the property shapes, you can get the owner names. Uh, and I sent them, a sent them a letter in the mail, like actually on paper. I know in a high tech community, like it doesn't make sense, but you know, I sent them letters in 2019 uh, and I also sent them follow-up letters in 2020 to all the people along the route who didn't sign up uh, and went and tracked that and, and continued to send them letters and say, hey, we're, we're still building service. You're still, you know, uh, please sign up. I got inv invited to a neighborhood meeting. There's some private roads that I passed and they had a road association meeting and they said, hey, come on out in uh, and, and talk to us and tell us what are you doing? What's the service going to look like and, and get to know them. Uh, one of the things that was a really funny coincidence is uh, one of the people uh, people on that street has the same uh, house number as I do. And we've actually been getting each other's mail uh, for 10 years or so uh, because the letter carrier sometimes uh, hands us uh, each other's mail. And funnily enough, in, in this, this is a small world thing. Uh, that person used to work at Merit on, uh, <laughs> a long time ago uh, and stuff. And ultimately, of, of all these people who I end up uh, building and, uh, you know, going through and connecting, about 70% of the people I passed signed up, uh, which actually was really great. So for in internet access, you know, you got you to gotta find that connection. And obviously, there's nothing down by me. Uh, you know, I had to go build, build up north uh, where there was some fiber. Uh, so I got a connection from ACDNet. Uh, they're still in the process of enabling IPv6 for me so I can go and have access for that. They actually, uh, you know, I'm nudging them to do that so uh, my consumers can have uh, v6 access and I can have v6 at home. Uh, you know, 123Net is still working on some, uh, getting me connected. I just got a project update from them yesterday, which is great. Uh, and once I'm connected to 123Net, I'll actually be at the Detroit Internet Exchange and you can peer with me there. Uh, and then, you know, the other important stuff. Aaron, you can apply for V6 space. Uh, and you know, once you have V6 space, you can also apply for V6, or sorry, you can apply for IPv4 space. And I, I had an old ASN line around that I was able to use for this project, which was nice. So I'm actually up with BGP and I'll be multi-homed uh, you know, here in short order uh, at my house. So what does the project look like? Uh, you know, turned in the blueprints, uh, th this entire span, like I said, is about two miles north, covering all the roads and uh, uh, paths that you need to do. You've got, you know, little waterways and uh, you see the, there's a green line for a natural gas pipeline that had to be crossed as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things you drive by on a day-to-day -day basis that you don't realize are there. Uh, and so if you slow down a little bit, you actually see all of these little details which impact your project, can impact a project like this. So... I had to also find contractors so, and have to have a good working relationship with them, which is uh, important. I actually went and I brought, brought them food out in the field. Uh, you know, not every day, but some of the times I'd be like, hey, you, know, you guys need some, you need some food. It was nice, it kept them happy, it kept them working. Uh, you know, and uh, it was important to be around. Um, you know, it, I, I'm not a fan of 2020 COVID aspect, but because of uh, the COVID situation, uh, I was home a lot more this year because business travel, uh, obviously, and I mean, I'm presenting this remotely. Uh, so a lot of people I'm sure understand this, you know, 
I was able to go out and resolve issues along the, uh, you know, along the way. Uh, I had to think about, hey, do I want to create policies around social media posts for my contractors uh, and get a good referral, you know, talk to a few different people if you're looking at doing a project like this, because, you know, knowing uh, the quality of work and having them uh, do things, uh, you know, it really makes a difference. Uh, and then, you know, I, I helped make sure they had all the right equipment. So some days, you know, they, they forgot something. I either loaned them a piece of equipment, uh, you know, or, or helped them out and, and ran to the store and got something uh, in order to make sure everything was smooth. Uh, so this is them when they were out boring past the natural gas pipeline. Uh, you know, this is, it's 18 inch natural gas pipeline. So it's, you know, relatively big, important, uh, services a lot of uh, Southeast Michigan. And, uh, you know, it happens to run right through the farm field behind my, my house. Uh, and so here they are, uh, you know, making sure and uh, that it's there with, uh, you know, a nice hydrovac, which is a, a tool I'm hoping to uh, maybe one day have access to uh, either myself or have someone else I know have one so I can borrow it when I need to go and uh, find things underground. And then, you know, there's the utility guy uh, watching and making sure that we don't uh, that actually my contractor doesn't put a big hole in this pipeline and uh, create a big mess. So along the way, you got to expect problems. We have this cursed corner. Um, every time we, uh, we got it located, they came back and they put the paint in a different location. Uh, you know, it, it really made things, uh, you know, extremely difficult. On top of that, you know, because there's existing utilities in the way, there's actually existing fiber there. Uh, that we found out, uh, you know, that unfortunately I wasn't able to get access to. There's existing fiber there, there's uh, gas, there's telephone, uh, you know, and then the, uh, the green lines are, uh, are my underground uh, conduits, uh, you know, on this bottom left here. Uh, and, you know, very short distance. This distance, took, uh, this span of 300 feet uh, took them three times to get because each time something different went wrong. Uh, you know, and then after we finally successfully got through it, one of the farmers actually stopped by and it's like, oh yeah, I know the guy who put in a lot of the utilities at that corner. He said, uh, yeah, anybody else who wants to put something in there is going to have a real hard time. Uh, turns out absolutely true. I had, had a real hard time there. So I, I managed to pick up some equipment along the way as well. Uh, I picked up what I call, you know, my uh, baby drill. It's a little uh, JT820. Uh, I picked it up for just eight grand. Uh, and I also have a, a cable plow that I, uh, you know, uh, use to bury service drops. It's actually owned by the wireless ISP that uh, uh, I get ac or I previously got access from, uh, which, you know, was nice because, you know, uh, it, it's nice to be able to share the equipment and not have to go and spend money on that myself. Uh, you know, here's a picture of the drill. And then, you know, uh, there we are bearing, uh, you know, you know, fiber service drop, uh, you know, a number of years ago. But like I said, things go wrong. So what happens? So somebody went and uh, decided that they wanted to borrow or take the, uh, take the machine. Uh, so the machine actually ended up for sale on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, which was interesting in Chicago, which is, you know, about a five to six hour drive away. Uh, thankfully I had this photo here on the left of in the spring when I was trying to get the conduit out of my yard and uh, having a real hard time. Uh, and I took the photo to send to some friends so they could laugh at me. But what was nice is that there were some distinctive uh, marks on the machine here uh, on the left that made it really easy uh, to, get the police involved and actually get them to reclaim this machine and be able to go pick it back up. So we were actually able to recover it, uh, you know, and uh, definitely one of those, you never know what's gonna happen uh, type of moments. So uh, anybody who's ever had that happen to them, something goes disappearing. Uh, yeah, definitely make sure you've got good photos of it and uh, you know, serial numbers and such. It's uh, really important. So I also had other construction issues. I actually received a stop work order in the middle of the project. Uh, you know, and so we went and worked with uh, uh, the local uh, county road commission uh, in order to go and uh, re you know, resolve this. Uh, their big concerns were that we didn't put enough stakes in the right of way. Uh, you know, and we weren't uh, 
they have a process whereby which you need to notify them every time you're out there working on it. And my crew was working three days a week on the project. And, you know, we notified them when we started the project, but we weren't notifying them every single week that they were coming back. Uh, and they want to be able to just drive by and, and, and know what's going on. So because of that, I had unbudgeted costs. I had to spend an extra $5,000 to survey and stake the right away. Uh, also the conduit that was in the ground, we had to mark it and locate it uh, and stuff like that. Uh, I actually got employee badges printed up uh, for myself and for several other people just to cover uh, stuff because during the COVID-19 time, it was really hard to tell. And uh, you know, what was exactly going on, especially in the spring when things were changing quickly. Uh, and, and like I said, it had to get water. You've got to get water to run a lot of this equipment. Uh, you know, and so I had $1,500 in uh, for the deposit on the, uh, uh, the fire department hookup on the, uh, uh, you know, for the fire hydrant that was not planned. You know, the other sorts of things, yeah, unmarked utilities. It's basically always the case that something happens. Uh, you, you're going to find something and somebody's not going to mark it right. Actually, just yesterday, uh, I called the local gas utility. I was out getting ready to do something uh, and they marked the gas main. It's a, I think it's a two or three inch gas main. Uh, it was marked off by 12 feet uh, from where it should, you know, where they should have marked it. Uh, and so it's really impo important. I've learned, you know, you always want to go out and double check all those marks and have your own locating equipment, uh, you know, for this. And so just, some of the things that happen along the way, it's, uh, you know, I, I know on Nanog, we often see, you know, oh, somebody hit this fiber or something. Uh, quite often, you know, people don't have records of it or it's just, you know, so, <laughs> people don't, don't hook up to all of them. Uh, just like I said, at that cursed corner, never got located twice. So after all this, you start getting out there, you do fiber installation, you can see the lovely cornfield. And I'll tell you something, it felt really great in some ways uh, you know, this uh, reel of fiber, this is the last of a 20,000 foot uh, reel of fiber uh, that we're laying out that's, uh, you know, being buried here. Uh, and, you know, when, once you realize you've used 20,000 feet of fiber, that is really, really uh, amazing. I ended up building my own fiber blower as part of this project. Uh, it actually worked out really well, uh, went 2,700 feet. Uh, you know, without an issue uh, in doing this, it helped to have the right, uh, right equipment uh, installed. And then you got to get out there and do all the fiber splicing. Uh, and so it was out there, uh, literally sitting on the side of the road, splicing everything together, uh, making it happen. Along the way, you got what do you do after you splice? You go, you check the OTDR trace. Uh, as, as you can tell, this is not a good OTR trace. It has quite a lot of loss on the short path. Uh, and so go back and clean up the splices, uh, you know, and after you do that, yeah, it lo looks a little bit better. It's still not great, but definitely, uh, definitely enough that it's uh, no longer an issue. I also need to upgrade my OTDR. Uh, you know, th this one's great for testing on, uh, you know, on uh, fiber that doesn't have any service on it. But once you have service on it, you really need uh, I really need a different OTDR than this. So I happen to know what I'm doing. I've been in this industry a few times. I was, I was talking with a member of the PC the other day. I said, yeah, I've been, I've been coming to Nanog since Nanog 8. So, you know, you get your scheduled service installed. Everything's going to be great, right? Well, had all sorts of things happen. So the tech had to visit the CO install an optic. He, he was like, Hey, yeah. Channel 44 optic, put it in the DWDM system. Uh, guess what? You know, he, he put it in the only system that had channel 44 available. Wrong system. Uh, the existing system had a one gig optic left in it. Uh, plus a 10 DB attenuator, uh, you know, that when they originally did the splicing where they were meeting me, uh, you know, they, they tested back. And so, uh, that was, that was interesting. So tech comes to my house delivers a 10 gig optic. I plug it into my router. I'm like, Hey, oh, I see, I see light. That's great. Well, it turns out he gave me a 10 gig LR. <laughs> it really needed to be something else. Also, uh, the, the ISP wanted to give me a CPE for on site. Uh, wanted to give me a 6,500. I politely declined and said, yeah, I'd really rather, uh, you know, can I please plug the optic into my own equipment or can you use some, you know, something smaller than a 6,504. 
So what I do, I hop in the car, uh, I drive to the ISP headquarter, uh, go and meet the guy on a Friday night, uh, give him back his uh, 10 gig LR, I get a one gig 80 kilometer optic, I visited a friend up in Lansing at the headquarters uh, and drove home, plugged in the optic. And then the most important thing, I get a syslog message saying, hey, my link is up. And this is great. So before, what is, what's my latency to, you know, to machine in 350 CIRMAC look like? It's about 30 milliseconds or so. Afterwards, I'm down to, you know, about eight, eight and a half seconds. You know, really a significant improvement, not only in latency, you know, you start doing trace routes and you say, hey, you can see all the intermediate cities like Jackson and Lansing uh, and stuff and uh, go and reach the machines in Chicago. You got to get have graphs. So, you know, I've got smoke ping here showing me, you know, hey, my latency went down. So that was great. Uh, you know, I waited a couple hours. I went to bed and I woke up in the middle of the night. And I'm like, ah, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to cut it over uh, and, and do stuff. Because, yeah, you know, I was expecting a 10 gig. It's a one gig. I didn't have BGP. You know, got to go to the next plan down the list. I, I grabbed an edge router X SFP, uh, plugged it in. It can do NAT. Uh, you know, and so I actually natted to the WAN IP address. Uh, and then the most important thing that you do besides looking at the, you know, the pings, here's a slide to make Tempkin happy, you know, going and showing, you know, Hey, uh, Netflix still runs, uh, you know, the uh, fast.com. I go, I look and I say, Hey, this is great. Considering, you know, you cut off a couple of zeros and that's what I was getting at, uh, most recently. There's a significant improvement. So remember, I got my neighbors pre-wired for fiber. So I removed all the rate limiters. I sent them a text message, you know, uh, once it was an appropriate hour. Uh, and best response, yowza. You know, it took me a couple more days. I, we got the optic swap to 10 gig. They pulled out the attenuator. We got BGP up with the right config uh, and stuff. So now, since then, I've been running around like crazy working seven days a week. Uh, you know, I've been getting customers pre-wired since the spring. Uh, but I, you know, because of all the unmarked utilities and people were upset that I kept cutting their AT&T lines, which were not well marked. Uh, you know, I, uh, I kind of paused doing that in the spring, but, you know, got as many people connected. I'm still out there doing, uh, you know, doing things with the exception of a brief pause in early September because, uh, you know, a family member had some medical needs. Uh, you know, yeah. And install takes me about two to four hours to do. Uh, and if, the, if everything's pre-wired, you know, it, it might take me less than an hour. It's basically just running cat five in and out of the house, you know, making sure all that looks real good. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of small dependencies I encounter along the way. Uh, and those definitely take time. What it cost? I'll tell you, 2020 had a lot of my costs, uh, you know, of, of $126,000 I spent, about 95,000 went to the directional drilling company. I had miscellaneous materials, I had that surveying. Uh, it took me a couple tries with the air compressor to kind of get a good system going. So uh, ended up uh, giving things, you know, renting it a couple times, you know, in order to get out of the stop work order, as well as to get some of the cable installed, uh, you know. And I don't know, maybe, maybe this is still cheaper to mo than moving, but I don't know, I've got fiber. So current customer status, I've got 23 customers online, including my house. I've got my business customer. The existing wireless ISP actually is buying access from me now. I have 13 people I still need to get installed. I've got two more prospects that I think I'm gonna be able to get hooked up uh, as well with uh, you know, a little bit of effort. One of them I've got to cross, across, cross and connect to their, like they've got about 160 acre campus uh, actually and, and get them service. So need to get across that. Uh, I still also have two people who are currently still hanging off my house on wireless uh, that were not pre-installed on fiber. Uh, and so that still needs to get done. Uh, you know, and I'm trying, you know, I've tried to be relatively fair with people. I say, Hey, you know, I'm installing you in the order which you signed up modulo some of the dependencies. So if you're really far out, I may not be able to get to you if there's, you know, some other little piece that needs to be built first, you know, also network usage. A lot of people are, are, are worried about, hey, what does it look like when you connect people to fiber? Uh, the majority of the people are actually not rate limited right now, uh, still to this day. 
so they, ha they, they basically have a gig at home. Uh, you know, the big spikes actually on the graph tend to actually be my house and my kids downloading some new game, uh, usually on the weekends uh, when they have it. But, you know, the, even with all that, the network usage uh, is less than, you know, is less than five megabits a subscriber, especially on the P95 basis. So I have way too many people to thank for this. You know, absolutely Ryan Peel at Virgin's Fiber. VB Fiber, Chris Fabian at uh, LakeNet, Antoine at Millennium, you know, uh, Roy, uh, Roy Grove at EasyWisp, which is the, the ISP uh, that I was getting access for, 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 from for 10 years. And all my neighbors out here, you know, who, uh, you know, were blocking the main road out there with all the construction vehicles all summer, uh, going and ma making it a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, basically lots of people who put up with me and encouraged me along the way, asking them, hey, how does this work? Uh, and stuff, especially my family where I've been out, you know, working, getting dirty, coming back with, uh, you know, stuff underneath my nails, uh, out to all hours, uh, you know, and, uh, my many friends who helped me with all the physical labor and other, other types of support just out there, you know, when you're moving something, uh, some of these large reels of fiber or conduit, you really got to have a second person helping you. So a lot of, you know, a, a lot of favors called in this year. So. If you're interested in doing something like this, there's actually some really cool Facebook groups that actually can help you with this. Uh, you know, there's a uh, Wisp Talk and the, you know, there's a Fiber to the Home group, uh, you know, where basically it's all of the Wisps who are starting to transition into the Fiber telco, uh, telco game uh, who, who all give advice to each other. And th these are some great resources for you out there. Uh, if you're looking at doing something either similar to this or, uh, you know, want to do something. With all that, uh, it looks like we have time for questions. Hi, welcome back to Nanog 80. And with me, I have Jared Mock from Akamai. And you just saw his presentation. Uh, we have a couple questions that were posted to the Q&A form. So Jared, you had that messed up on your machine, didn't you? Uh, I, I do ha I do have them pulled up so uh, I can I, I can just answer the ones uh, you know that I've seen in there so fr from Ian uh, you know he asks uh, what happens if I try to move uh, and all the stuff is in my basement uh, so actually when I constructed uh, and designed how the fiber would come into my street and on my house we actually put an extra service loop where the conduit goes down the road and then back um, right by where one of the electrical transformers is. Uh, that's actually in my property. Uh, and so if I was to move or something, I can actually uh, grant myself an easement before I move, uh, you know, on my way out of, uh, out of the neighborhood and go and move the equipment there relatively easily by just uh, moving the splice point. Um, as, as far as, uh, you know, so uh, Adair asked uh, w whether or not I, w what I have for a kind of backup, uh, you know, if I'm traveling or something, because many of you have seen me around the world traveling, uh, you know, at Nanog and the other conferences, uh, the uh, existing wireless ISP, uh, he, he and I have really, you know, I, I very carefully tried to not be in a business partnership with him, but we've really helped each other out. Uh, you know, the way you would get mutual aid from a lot of other people, you know, I'm sure many people who have either friend colo or have had friends go into their data center space and, you know, power cycle things for them. Uh, and so we, we really have a good working relationship. So when he's out of town, you know, I go over, I can check on some of his wireless equipment for him if customers complain. Uh, and, you know, we kind of have a, you know, a mutual handshake agreement on that. But I did budget for that, actually, uh, you know, for paying him or somebody else. Uh, to, to account for those, uh, you know, for those types of expenses. Uh, Ramon Wu asked how many customers I have signed up. Uh, you know, so I, uh, you know, that's covered in one of the slides where I've got, I think, 23 people up right now uh, and a couple, you know, and another about 15 to 20 or so that I'm in the process of doing. And, and I'm actively making plans for how I'm going to expand uh, this. So I'm, I'm in active discussions with a number of contractors and people who are in some other high density neighborhoods who've seen what I've done and want, want me to bring services in there because uh, either they've got limited DSL speeds or no DSL available in their area. Uh, Blake actually asked a very interesting question, uh, Blake Willis, uh, about contractor social media policy. 
I, I, I wanted to just comment on that because I think many of us are used to taking pictures of, of different things or posting about our experiences. Uh, during the stop work order, one of the, uh, one of the uh, people who worked for my uh, directional boring contractor, uh, they posted uh, a rant about the uh, stop work order and, and how that all went down. Uh, and that actually caught the attention of the local uh, uh, road commission people who are the ones who I had to pull the permits through. Uh, and so you, you want to be mindful of what, of how, uh, how people who are in your employ, either directly or indirectly as part of that, may post on social media about uh, the work that they're doing for you. So, uh, you know, in the event that they might post a po photo of themselves on private property or something. Um, I'm, I'm told we've got about a minute or two left here. Um, you know, so, uh, there's a question about the right of way. So the right of way, I permitted that all, uh, the reason, the reason why I started a telephone company is because it's easier to actually gain access to the right of way, uh, by being a listed utility in the state of Michigan, uh, from the local permitting agency. So, uh, that, uh, that is actually the main reason why I did that. And since it was only a thousand dollars to file the tariff, it actually is a relatively modest, uh, cost considered the, considering the cost of the entire project. Um, I don't know, Dave, uh, or I'm sorry, Michael, what other questions, uh, you want to do one more, that would be great. And then we can go right into our next presentation. Yeah, so, so there's at least two different questions kind of about utility marking and location. Uh, so the way it works in Michigan, and this really varies state by state. Uh, so the way it works in Michigan is uh, you join to be a member of something, uh, you know, of the Mystic organization. Uh, it, I then get notified. Uh, you can have a contractor who you pay to get notified. For example, some people use URG or USIC you know, who are contractors who go out and mark for, you know, for Comcast, AT&T, or our local electric and, and water people. Um, but realistically, it's up to you to make sure that it gets marked and gets marked correctly uh, and that they get uh, notified. And so if you're within, if you hit a utility that's within 48 inches of where they put paint or flags uh, and, and they marked it correctly, uh, you're liable. If they didn't mark it correctly, the utility is liable uh, in the case of that. Uh, that's at least the way it works in Michigan state law. Um, and there's a, there's a number of, uh, you know, additional things that kind of come with that about uh, what needs to happen. So in the case of the pipeline where I showed the photo of us, uh, of the contractor boring past the pipeline, they required a uh, utility representative to be on site for that, which is why I have that photo of us standing out there over the pipeline, uh, you know, and, and he's there basically saying like, nope, you know, you got to be very careful because, uh, you know, I think that's roughly the same size of a pipeline that, uh, uh, you know, w was damaged a number of years ago in the Bay Area to uh, uh, to a great deal of excitement to many residents out there. It made national news, so we, I don't want to be on the national news for you know for uh, damaging somebody's uh, pipeline. Thank you very much, Jared. Uh, excellent presentation. Mm -hmm.